So there's one thing I wanted to uh, mention before we start. We're going to do today something quite interesting. It's the integral controller. And we're going to look at something called the command filter um, or a reference filter. These two things are commonly used in control applications. Before I go to that, let me just explain you one thing, okay? We had this architecture. Um, we'd have x, we would have k, right? and this, would, this was your feedback. So this was your feedback controller, okay? So, and here is the pilot or the operator, right? The person who is or where we send in the inputs. Okay, and this is where the actuation happens. The output here is U, so this is, this is like the, this is what we call the reference input. But this is what I would call U or the actuator input. Right? So the pilot would be sitting here, would give some inputs to the aircraft, and in between the controller would change its input in a certain way and would send that input to the actuator, basically to the aileron, elevator, whatever, that, that would go into um, the aircraft. Right? This represents <coughs> the airplane, although this is a linear model, it represents the aircraft. Right? So this is what happens. Now, the question for, uh, that I get from students usually is, okay, but we are just getting inputs and this is stabilizing, right? This is a stabilization. So we would be stabilizing the system. So now that this part is somewhat, behaves somewhat better than the real stuff, uh, the, the, um, the open loop, right? This is what we have been doing. Now, oftentimes in control applications, you would see this architecture, R plus, sorry, plus minus. You would put a K over here, and then this would go into the linear model. Output would be X, and input would look like this, okay? This is an architecture you will see very frequently. And oftentimes, this is actually it's easier to explain in terms of what the controller is doing. Because <coughs> this is uh, it's a little different in the way we are looking at this. But there might be applications for this architecture as well. Since the output here is x, not the output, I mean the feedback is x, and the size of R and X must be the same, only then you can have some sort of an error between what is X and what is R. And you multiply this with K and send it over here, and this will still work. Now I will tell you a little bit about this in a second, but you need to understand the difference. Here you have X as, that goes into K, and R does not have to have the same size as X. You see that, right? Because we have done this before, you have four uh, uh, states, but the input can only be one, in which case k would be a vector, and you multiply this vector with that vector and you get a number, a row vector and a column vector, right? So x and r don't have to be the same in this architecture. But assume that for a second that x and r are indeed the same size, okay? In that case, then x minus r times e times k and u, this would give you a uh, interesting or a nice um, um, architecture. Now, how does this compare to this? How do you calculate this k? Okay, well, guess what? The calculation of this k and this k are identical. Okay, so because let's write the equations for this one. The equations for that will look like that. x dot is equal to ax plus b and u is equal to r minus x times k, right? That would be um, plus k times r minus x. So it will look like that. 
So if you take this into the parentheses, you will get something like that. X dot is equal to A minus K, uh, BK, sorry, A minus BK um, times X plus B times KR. All right? So if you look at this, this is that. All right. If you look at this, a minus b k is still the closed loop eigenvalues. Has still the, is, is still the system matrix of the closed loop system. Okay. System matrix of the closed loop system of closed loop. Okay. System matrix of the closed loop. It's a minus b k. So it's still the same. It was the same over here as well, right? For this one, the, the closed loop looked like this. A minus BK times X plus B times R. So the only difference is actually here, right? One has the input of R, okay? And here the input is actually, I mean the input to the system will be K times R to the closed loop system. Although the input looks like it's R, from a system's point of view, it is actually k plus r. But the system matrix of the closed loop is still the same. In other words, if you would move the k from here to here, you are not using the system matrix eigenvalues of the closed loop. You understand that? The closed loop system has system matrix that is equal to a minus bk. Therefore, the eigenvalues of the closed loop is identical to this. This is also a minus bk, so this is also a minus bk. Okay? So keeping the k over here or here doesn't really change much our calculations. What will change is though, first of all, you need to be careful with the sizes. R must be equal to x, which is not always true, of course. This, is, this would probably be true, for example, if x has two, uh, if you have two uh, states and two controls. Right? Then it will work. Or you have one state and one control, then it will work. Three states, three controls, yes. But if you have eight states and one control, this will not work. Right? You cannot compare these two. But here you can do that. Okay? Here you cannot. So where is this useful? Well, this is what we usually call a tracking problem. This is a stabilization, and this would be a tracking problem. We would try to track the axis here. Let me give you an example. To make it simple, I'm going to make it a one state system. Let's say I have one state x, and let's make it q, OK? And um, maybe. Make it an example, make it like this. Q dot is equal to AQ plus B, I don't know, del E. Del E. Del E is the input to the elevator, and Q is the angular rate of the aircraft, right? So it's a single input, single output system. And let's say you want to do, oh, sorry. Excuse me. So you take that. Go back here, plus minus, add a k, this would be. And here, the input here would be q command. OK, let's call it a command, q command. And this would be here q, the output of the state. OK, qc is the q, uh, is the pitch rate command. pitch rate command. So what you're getting here is QC minus Q is equal to the error E. So E is equal to QC minus Q, right? And then you get the error, multiply that error with K, send it as the input to the system, and the output will be some sort of Q, and you keep comparing. So if you look at this E, this error, is really the error between what's, what should be, I mean here, what should be and what it, what it actually is. 
Okay, so if the command of the control is equal to the output Q, then the error will be equal to zero, right? And then nothing will happen, so you will have no new input over here. However, if QC is different from Q, so it will increase or reduce the control to that thing multiplied with K. So what you're really trying to do here, you're trying to track QC, okay? So if you had a good system here, it would look like this. I mean, a good design system, QC versus time. So and let's say Q and QC, okay? Let's say this is zero here and you start here and you have some sort of a ramped input. What you would see is that that Q, if you have a good design system, would do something like that, okay? And that would be Q and that would be QC. And the closed loop response of this tracking problem would be the same as this one because the closed loop eigenvalues would still be sitting at A minus BK, okay? The closed loop eigenvalues would still be sitting at A minus BK, all right? So, but this is now a single input, single output system, of course, right? So if, you, if this was a second order system, you would need two controls over here. It would be the aileron and the, ele uh, the, the elevator, maybe. And then you would have two, control, uh, two states and two controls. Otherwise, you cannot compare these two, okay? So in a lot of tracking problems, okay, the way I say it's tracking, you would have one input and one output, something like that, or you had two inputs, two outputs, something like this. But on the other hand, you would stabilize this thing at first. And so this is the stabilization part. You understand that? You have questions for this? Does it make sense or not? Yes? For this one, we want to use uh, QC as a result, right? Yes, the QC should be, the, is the target. Yeah, yeah, we want to make QC because as long if QC is not equal to Q, you will s keep sending an error and therefore keep changing delta E. Look at this, if QC and Q are not equal, right? This is the error here. That's the error, right? So that's the error. The only time when you're not sending a signal is when error is equal to zero then you will not send a signal, right? Understand? Okay. Understand that? Okay. Now here's the interesting thing though, of course, this requires that x is equal to, I mean the, the number of states is, in, in, is equal to the n number of controls, which is not always the case. So your question might be, of course, can you do this all the time? How do you do a tracking problem, right, if the number of inputs and number of states are not equal, which is often the time, all right? So this is how we approach the problem. And now listen carefully, okay? This is, this is important now. Um, let me do it here, maybe. The way we approach this is the following. Let's say plus minus, let's say I have a system that looks like this, AX plus BU. Output is X, okay? I would do exactly what I have been doing in the previous weeks. I would get this X, multiply with K, and add to this and I would still have my R and my U. So, what's happening here? The pilot was sitting here, right? Was giving an input to the aileron, let's say. Now the pilot is sitting here, but the input of the aileron is being changed because of this K. I explained this to you, okay? So it's, the controller is modifying the input of the pilot. The pilot, if, you, if K was equal to zero, you would still, R would be equal to U, and you would immediately control the controls as usual, meaning the aileron and the elevator and so on and so forth, right? 
But now that I have, I, I still think I'm controlling the elevator or the aileron, but someone's interfering with my system and it's basically making it more stable or the way we want it. We, we place the eigenvalues. We call it, we place the eigenvalues to places that we want. Okay? So this is that. So this, is, this R really is almost like controlling the elevator or the aileron directly, except someone's interfering with it a little bit, just to stabilize the system. Okay? So as far as the pilot is concerned, this is the aircraft. It's still giving inputs to the aileron and the elevator and, 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 and the rudder and so on and so forth. And it's being modified a little bit inside. So this is stabilizing the system. So the, the, the role of this feedback gain K is really to stabilize the system, right? This is a stabilization loop. Stabilize. OK? So how are we going to match the stabilization problem with the tracking problem? We need to marry them somehow so that we have a tracking problem embedded in a stabilizing problem. They have to happen at the same time. Because we have this, this, this tracking problem is happening very often. See, if you have a passenger airplane, and let's say you're flying at 10,000 feet, and you want to go to 20,000 feet or to 15,000 feet, OK? So the pilot, of course, can pitch up, give a little bit throttle, and then climb and all this. This is a manual control. But the autopilots don't work that way. You have a little dial. You go like 15,000 feet, enter, and the airplane goes to 15,000 feet. That's a tracking problem, right? You have 15,000 feet over here. Airplane is at 10,000 feet. You enter the dial, and immediately you have an error, and it gives you an elevator and a throttle at the same time, and you climb to 15,000 feet. Auto, all automatic, that's the autopilot, right? So the autopilot is using that, it's using a tracking problem. So, but at the same time, the aircraft is stabilized in, at the same time, the aircraft is still stable, so you have this and you have this, okay? So how do we use this plus this? So this is how it works. Take x, take c. Now have an output y. OK? Take that. Move over here. Command now. That's what you do. It's quite similar to this thing, except now this is the closed loop, right? This is now the closed loop. And around that closed loop, you have another loop, okay, which gives you the tracking. Now, if you look at this architecture now, first of all, the inside is still a stable system the way you want it. The eigenvalues are moved to places that you liked in this one. right? And the calculation of this k is exactly the way we did it in class before. You calculate the k. Is that okay? But then you want to have a tracking around this, which means, for example, now this can be Q, this can be theta, some sort of a target, or just like I gave you that example, this could be the altitude, right? So you calculate the altitude from here. I put a C here, right? The, from the output, I take that, compare these two, okay? Multiply with this k, and this will be like an input to the system. The input is, if k was equal to 0, it would be directly the elevator or the aileron, and it would be the same as this one. If k was equal to 0, this would be exactly like that. Right? I mean, except that c, of course. I mean, exactly like that. But now that k is here, K is interfering with the, pro, with, the, with the signal that is actually coming from the controller. Okay? So where is the pilot now? The pilot is here. Okay? And the pilot is really giving commands to the airplane in terms of states. For instance, the pilot will say, 
you want to give an example, we can do that example, QC, a command for angular rate. And the output here could be Q. So you'd compare the control command Q, uh, uh, of, of Q with Q, and this would be an error, and you multiply K with error, and it goes inside. So what does it provide? It provides a stabilization loop inside. It's a stabilization loop. And on the outside, you have a tracking loop, which will track a certain command. Okay? And this is very frequently what we see in airplanes. For example, you have these fighter airplanes, for example, they're controlling the rate on the, con on, the, on the pilot stick. Right? They control rate. You do this, it goes like, and you bring it back, and it stays there. You do this, you do this. We, we call it rate command attitude hold. It gives you the rate, and then holds the attitude. Do that, comes back with the rate, and then holds the attitude. Okay? So this is the kind of architecture you would see in these things. Because the pilot stick now does not command the aileron or the elevator, it commands this. So the pilot stick would look like that. Okay, the pilot stick, and the pilot stick could move here and then here. And I'm just making this up now, if this is the maximum, and this is the minimum of the pilot stick, okay? It might correspond, I, these are, I'm just making these numbers up now, Q is equal to five radians per second, and here Q is equal to minus five radians per second. So this is the command on the pilot stick, because the pilot is sitting here now, right? So the maximum is five radians per second, minimum is five radians per second, okay? A lot of rate. All right? And if you put it in the middle, QC would be equal to zero. And that QC is right here, okay? And it goes into that control system and it compares it with the Q, multiplies it with K, sends it inside, but the stabilization loop, the way we calculate it, is still here. Understood? Is it like an EFP controller to our space-based No. This is an outer loop. We can later talk about PIDs and all that. Uh, this is like a P control. This is like a proportional control. You're right. It's an outer loop P control, if that's what you're asking. Yes. The inside we call a stabilization loop, and we call this, oftentimes we call it the inner loop, because it's inside. And around that loop, we have another loop. We call it the outer loop. OK? Because now it is another loop or in, over the inner loop. The inner loop's job is to stabilize the system. The outer loop is to track the system. And in this example, we are trying to track the angular rate. If the pilot sets the stick to the maximum on one side, you will have, let's say, um, uh, you will have a pitch rate of five radians per second. If you put it this way, it will be a in this case, it would be a plus five radians per second, right? And that would be your rate command. This will stabilize, and this will make sure that this is doing the rate command. Another example is, instead of the rate, you might be tracking, say, the altitude. Sir? Yes? Uh, I have a question about this. Yes. Uh, the black K and the red K are the same. Right? They are different. They will be different. You're right, maybe call this K1 or something. They are not the same. You, you design this K as is, and then you design another K over here, assuming that this is your closed loop system now. Okay. Another example is instead of giving QC, I mean the uh, uh, angular rate, you might have something else. Let me just do that other example where we feedback where we have. The altitude could be an input. So the output here could be the altitude h. Okay? So you will have an altitude command, and you will have a, an altitude measurement. You compare these two and make sure that oh, the error will be equal to 0 only if they are equal to 0, of course, if, 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 if they are the same, if this is equal to that. And then you multiply this, and you have a control, and so on and so forth. So this is the outer loop to control the altitude. So 
what would it look like? The pilot would sit in the cockpit, as I said, would say, I want to go to 20,000 feet. You dial this thing, 20,000 feet, enter. So this will become 20,000. And then you send this over. And if they are not equal, you will have an error multiplied with k. It goes into that. So this still exists. It still stabilizes the system. But you are tracking the altitude now. OK? So in the inner loop, the stabilizing loop, gives you a loop that makes things just simpler. It, it just stabilizes this whole thing. You have a stable airplane to play with. Okay? You're not trying to bring an unstable airplane to a certain altitude. You're trying to bring the airplane, a stable airplane to a certain altitude, and the stabilization is done through that K. And the output would be this. Now, as I said, you could actually move that K over here as is. The problem is you are not stabilizing here. Secondly, this must be equal to that, which doesn't really work all the time. You need that C in order to do that outer loop. You understand what we are trying to do? We can try this in Simulink, maybe in the next hour, and I'll show you all the things we can do with this architecture. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Let's say the outer loop takes you from 10,000 to 20,000 feet, right? Then you might say, well, we designed, this was only valid for uh, 10,000 feet, right? That's what you're saying. So in 10,000 feet, you will have a K. You have calculated a K, but now you're suddenly at 20,000 feet. What's going to happen? What's going to happen is that when you design a control system, you want to design the K values for different altitudes. So when you're at 10,000 feet, this will be a certain K. When you're 20,000, you will probably pick up another set of Ks. And while you're going, maybe 10,000, 12,000, 15,000, 16,000, you might be picking different Ks. This is what we call gain scheduling. So when you design a control system, you design these feedbacks not only for one flight condition, you, you design it for a lot of flight conditions. So when you are in that flight condition, you pick up those sets of gains. When you're in another flight condition, you pick up those sets of gains. So there's not one set of gains. What we have done in the past few weeks is that we designed feedback gains for one flight condition. So in real life, you would be calculating a lot of Ks for a lot of different flight conditions. And while you're flying, you would pick that, 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 that. And that would be true for this K and for this K as well. But you're right, the methods we have learned are only valid for those flight conditions that are around the equilibrium point. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? OK, so one other thing we can do sometimes in this altitude thing, if you, if you have this kind of an architecture, OK, time and, let's say, altitude, OK? And here you have an altitude command, all right? Let's say you have something like that. What's going to happen is that, let's say you have, as I give the same example as I gave just now, let's say you, have, you are at 10,000 feet and you designed a controller that wants to take you to 20,000 feet. Okay? And let's say you have a real step input here. Let's say you have a real step input. Okay, like this. So, so the pilot is sitting in the cockpit, is at 10,000 feet. You can see it in your gauges. You say 20,000 feet, enter, which means you are entering at 20,000 feet to the command, which is essentially giving a step input to the system. Okay? What's going to happen, I mean, what you want to happen is that the airplane wants to do that. We, we want the airplane to do this. We want this perfect matching with the 20,000 feet and with the 20,000 feet of the airplane. So this is what you want to see, right? You want the airplane to go up and make a perfect altitude. So you don't really want to see that, do you? No, we don't want to see that. You don't want to see the airplane doing that, right? You just want to go really nice and smooth. How can you do that? Well, first of all, you can design this K very nicely. Okay? 
And there are some other tricks you can do. I will show you hopefully in the, in the last hour. And another thing is, if you have taken classic control, you might remember that at the end, they are not really match all the time. You might have something called a steady state error. Remember that? Don't remember? You haven't taken controls? System dynamics, you, you, you remember something called a steady state error, right? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Just want to make sure you're not dead yet. Okay, you have a steady state error, okay? So you don't want that. Let's say you want to go to 20,000 feet and you have a steady state error of 1,000 feet, you are stuck at 19,000 feet. Why is that happening? Well, it happens because you don't have, the, the, the error is so small, so insignificant, that this guy does, does not move anymore. And it's very, very small. So this is small. It becomes a very small number. It's not enough to move that thing to where it's supposed to go. So that little error will stay there forever and ever. That's another problem you will see. Again, this is something we can try and simulate and see. Okay? This might be small, and oftentimes it might be insignificant. You might say, well, I wanted to go to 20,000 feet. I'm at 19.5, so whatever. I'm close to 20,000. You could do that. Controls engineers, they don't like it very much. We want to have it perfect, 20,000 feet. Okay? And the way to put this exactly at 20,000 feet and basically remove that steady state error is by putting a little integral at the front or at the back, it doesn't matter. Let me just see how I use the convention here. I put it behind, okay. The way to remove the steady state error is by adding an integral signal over here and multiply that integral over here. It's an integral. So I take that, take an integral of that error, multiply it with k and send it over what will that provide? It will provide me the fact that error, steady state error will go to zero as time goes by. Steady state error will go to zero as t goes to infinity, right? So that's the goal. And I will show you in the next hour why this happens, why an integral will remove the steady state error. Okay, mathematically we can see it. But from a conceptual point of view, how is it possible that if you put an integral that this steady state error will go away? Okay? So here's what happens. The error that you see here is still the error between the commanded altitude and the real altitude. Right? That's the error. Let's say this error is very small. Let's make it so small that it's only 5 feet. It's not even 500 feet. Let's say very small, 5 feet. Very, very tiny. Five feet is about this much. Okay? So the error is five feet. So if you don't have an integral, the five feet is so small that it will not really produce much of an input and that five feet will stay there forever. Okay? So the error is five feet. Remember that. Now pay attention for one second. Look up here. Let's say you have five feet of an error. Five feet of an error. If you take an integral as time goes by, as a function of time, if you do this, take the integral of e dt as time goes by, okay? That five feet will add on top of each other at each time, right? So it will, that, that, it will look like this. If you have the integral of the error as time goes by, what's going to happen if you take the integral? It's going to look like this. At the beginning, it will be 5 feet. The next, it will be 10 feet. Let's say you go one second at a time. Then it will be 15, 20, 25. You add the error as time goes by on top of each other. 
So suddenly the error that you see over here, this EI, will become larger and larger so that this will actually start reacting to this. Did you understand that? If you don't have the integral, it is five feet. Five feet is very small into the system. But if you take this five feet and take an integral with respect to time, as time goes by, the five feet will add on top of each other. So this signal will become larger and larger. So that this system will actually start reacting to it. And although this is small, you will have a reaction from the system. Understand? Because as time goes by, you're adding these things. This is what we call an integral controller. And we use this integral controller for tracking quite often, especially for things like altitude and so on and so forth. OK? Do you understand conceptually what we will be trying to do? From now on, I'm going to write the mathematics, and I want to show you how I calculate these numbers. <coughs> but do you understand why I need an integral controller? Do you understand what a tracking controller does? Do you understand the difference between inner loop and outer loop? What the, I'm using this one for stabilization, this one for tracking. And I prefer oftentimes an integral because it will get rid of the steady state error. I could be doing this, except they have to be the same size, but this is not really true for, for most applications. In that case, you have C. So how does now C, the output control, work together with the inner loop stabilization? Okay? Yes? What if the error being accomplished uh, after integral uh, grows that uh, we don't want? If it grows too much, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, this will not grow only if the steady state error is equal to zero. If this becomes equal to zero. Right? If it's zero, it won't grow anymore. Right? If it's not zero, it will grow. Right? Okay. So. You design it in such a way that the steady state error goes to actually to exactly zero. If it doesn't go to zero, then you're in trouble. Then it will grow. But that's the goal of this. It is the, grow, it's the goal of this to make the steady state error zero. So the design will be such that the steady state error will definitely go to zero, and therefore this will be equal to zero, and then this will be equal to zero. Okay? But you have a good point. You have to be very careful now in your design. If you make an error somewhere, and this error will never go to steady state, you might actually have something that will grow to very large numbers and destabilize the whole system. Therefore, in practice, when you design an integral controller, there are a lot of concerns, and you have to be very careful. When you design a control system, what you usually do is you put a lot of checks and balances everywhere. Just make sure that this doesn't grow to infinity. Just make sure that this integral doesn't go to very large numbers. And you, you make ad hoc solutions. You can do ad hoc solutions, which means if the integral goes beyond this, start from zero again. You know, just a thing. Let's say this goes to thing. If it's too high, just jump over here and start again. Just jump over here and start again. Don't do this. But this is an ad hoc solution. Don't, don't use this in this class. I'm just saying in practical applications, you have to be careful. Sometimes you put a little limiter over here, just in case you don't have a large number jumping into the system. Because if you have an error somewhere, if you are destabilized, can you imagine what will happen here? You're adding all these things into the integral. So this looks good on paper, and it is used in a lot of places but the actual application requires a lot of attention because of the reason you mentioned. If this error becomes too large, you can actually grow to infinity. And it's, it's not because of the destabilization. It is not because of anything else. It's just because you have something stupid over here. Okay? And imagine that you have a wrong measurement over here. For some reason, your altitude measurement is not good. You start jumping around here. Or this, you know, there are lots of, lots of problems and practical applications you have to do. But before we go to the practical application, let's do the theory. You understand this steady state error problem, right? You understand why we are doing that? You could actually remove that and have another control problem. We can do that too. But the integral is something that we use quite often, and I wanted to show you the one with the integral. 
Any other questions? Okay, so let's give a break and I will do this in the next hour.